Hey, thank you for meeting me here. Uh, we had some sort of snafu this morning with our live streaming. And if you tried to watch us earlier this morning uh, from our, our courtyard uh, for our worship time and your you know, live stream just finished before we got going, I think we got about five minutes into it and it just uh, went out on us. Uh, we apologize for that. Uh, so I wanted to just sort of record this and post it so you would at least have uh, a word this morning. And also that'll help us on Tuesday night when we have our class. And if you don't know about our class, we have an adult class on Tuesday evening, 7 o'clock. Uh, the login information is on our website and uh, we do it via the Zoom platform. And we will be discussing uh, the text that we're going to be going over right now. If you are joining us for the first time, thank you for joining us. We are going through Mark's gospel, and we began a few weeks ago. We are still in chapter one, and we are going to begin this morning in verse 14. And Mark says this, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for men or for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So I want to talk a little bit this morning about fishing. Right before these events that we just read about occurred, uh, Mark in his gospel has declared Jesus Messiah, Son of God, and King. And in King Jesus's world, when the kingdom of heaven draws near, fishing is one of the things that happens. And Jesus says basically that because the kingdom of God is near, because I am here, and Jesus sums up what the kingdom of God is and is about, fishing season is open. Mark tells us that Jesus came preaching about the good news of God and the kingdom of God. And when Jesus preaches about the good news of God and the kingdom of God, I think he is initially announcing an event that people have been waiting for for a very long time. He's not going around talking about the seven steps to a better prayer life, um, seven steps to a better marriage. What he is talking about might impact things like our prayer lives or, or marriages, uh, but he is talking about something much bigger and something that's also uh, much more dangerous. Jesus is saying that God is breaking into the world right now. He is breaking into the present in a way that he has been promising for such a long time, but also in a way that he has never, ever previously done. And the time for waiting for God's Messiah and for God's deliverance, for God's intervention in matters, that time is over. Now, for a lot of people who are hearing Jesus, uh, hearing his kingdom of God talk, um, that would make them think that Jesus is saying that God is about to put things right here in the world. He's about to call his chosen people together for their reward. He's about to bring judgment on the people out there who deserve it. He's about to reestablish uh, the kingdom of Israel. But like has happened so many other times uh, throughout the history of the Bible, when God steps onto the stage of human history, it often comes in a way that is different from uh, what people expect and a lot of times what people want. 
And as we go through Mark's gospel, we're going to see that there really is this disconnect between what Jesus's view of the kingdom of God is and what the people are expecting the kingdom of God to be. Now, Jesus's teaching about the kingdom of God, that's going to come uh, further, the further we get into Mark's gospel, that, that Jesus' teaching about the kingdom is coming. But for now, Jesus is more about announcing its arrival. And his announcing, which is when he says, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news, that really is a summons. What Jesus is preaching, in his mind, demands a response. And so what does it mean? Uh, to repent and believe. What is Jesus expecting of people who hear him? Well, repentance isn't so much the idea of, um, I used the example this morning in, in our uh, courtyard church, um, it's not so much the idea of, hey, you've been taking some copy paper from the office and taking it home and using it for your personal sorts of endeavors. Um, and you should stop doing that. Well, yes, uh, if you stop doing that, that would be repenting. And in fact, you should stop doing that if that's what you're doing. But the repentance that Jesus is talking about is much more foundational and all-encompassing. Uh, it is a call to make a life decision. And Jesus is saying, when he says, repent and believe the good news, he is saying, choose God or don't choose God. Uh, either you submit to the summons or you choose this world. And when you think about the message of repentance, um, that message has always been a tough sell in, in the world, right? I am sure it was a tough sell um, for lots of people who were listening to Jesus. Uh, it was a tough sell for early Christians and Christians throughout history. Uh, it is a tough sell today. And it's not only a tough sell uh, for people who aren't Christians, it's a tough sell for people of faith, people who, who have grown up or have some sort of relationship um, with, with church and Christianity. Sometimes we wince when we hear repentance, talk about repentance, a message of repentance, because we have seen uh, various times in our life um, that message used to really tear somebody up uh, and sometimes somebody that we might have really cared about. And it's kind of similar. It's the same dynamic as if, uh, and you think about the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, um, famous parable that Jesus tells and when the prodigal son comes back, what if the story had gone that the older brother was the first one to meet him? And given what we know in that story about the older brother, he's the one who has stayed behind and dutifully worked on the farm there. But he has worked with a lot of bitterness. He resents having to do this. And um, so if his uh, uh, very messed up and selfish um, younger brother comes back and he sees him first, he goes out, you know, down the driveway to meet him and just gives him a scathing dress down um, for the way he's been living his life. And just really, you know, punitive in his words and just kind of nasty. Um, the younger brother is probably going to make a, a pretty quick U-turn and head back to the far country and to the pigsty. Uh, rather than wait to see maybe what his father has to say about these matters. Well, here, I mean, that's why people don't like the idea of repentance sometimes, because they've seen it play out like that. Well, here, I, I, I think Jesus's call to repent is not so much a, a scathing reprimand, but really more of an invitation to switch allegiances. Another problem I think we have sometimes with a message of repentance is that we really just don't like anybody telling us that we need to change, right? We don't like people telling us what to do, and we especially don't like people telling us that we need to change something about our lives. And that dislike of, of not wanting to hear that we need to change something, that sometimes even gets compounded by our commitment to, to justify 
ourselves or our our behavior, our, our commitment to excuse ourselves. Um, that uh, Dave is the way he is, and a lot of that's because of these out you know outside influences, these these exterior influences on on my life, uh, outside circumstances. Well, I have no doubt that every one of us. Uh, has been influenced and impacted by things outside of our control. But we also run the risk of um, starting to sound like Moses' brother Aaron when he made the golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai when Moses had gone up to get uh, God's law. And if you remember that story uh, back in Exodus, uh, you know, they are waiting there and Moses has gone up and they're kind of getting tired that Moses has been lingering up in the mountains there for a long time and they're getting restless. And so they want a God and the people convince Aaron to make a golden image that they can worship. And they bring their earrings and necklaces and all kinds of jewelry and he melts it down and builds this golden calf. And when Moses comes back off the mountain, he's really hacked, rightfully so. And he confronts his brother about this, and Aaron says, well, um, I threw this in this gold in the fire, and out came this calf. You know, like, it wasn't my fault. It just sort of happened. And in Aaron, you see a lot of blame shifting going on. Well, the reality is, is that, that blame shifting has been happening from the very beginning uh, of mankind. Uh, Adam try to, to blame both Eve and God uh, for his own sin. And Eve tried to blame the serpent for her sin in the garden. Um, so this has been going on for quite a while. And when we lose any sense of sin and personal responsibility, we usually lose any sort of desire um, for pardon, but also any sort of desire for a new direction. And we end up just keeping on like we've been keeping on. Well, like I said, Jesus isn't just after these little behavioral changes. He's talking about my, my total direction in life. He's looking for something um, to happen to me uh, deep down where I become willing um, to let everything go, everything that's important to me, uh, to lay it down, to get low, and to actually become a slave, which is the language that Mark is going to use the further we get into his gospel. Now, of course, Jesus knows I'm going to fail at that. I can have that attitude and, you know, muck it up pretty quickly. Of course, he knows that that's going to happen. But just because he knows that and just because it will happen, that doesn't change his call. Jesus is calling people to drop everything. And with everything that you are, repent, choose God, and then come and follow me. It means obedience. Uh, it means being ready to follow where, wherever Jesus leads you to, to do what, whatever Jesus calls you to. And how do I know that? Well, I know that from this story for sure, because of number one, how Mark records the very next verses, Peter, Andrew, James, and John's responses to Jesus. And number two, what Jesus tells them he's going to make them into. When you read about uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John deciding to follow Jesus in John's gospel or in Luke's gospel, their decision to do that seems a little more reasonable. Uh, in John's gospel, if you flip over and, and read that um, with these events, when, when Jesus calls um, these first four guys, in John's gospel, before that happens, you've got James and John are, are listed as uh, helping John the Baptist in his ministry. So they're already, you know, they've got their feet in the water on this. And you have John the Baptist in that gospel pointing to Jesus and saying, look, uh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he tells James and John, you got to follow him. I got to become less. He needs to become greater. Uh, in Luke's gospel, we have these miraculous healings 
that happen uh, towards the beginning of the gospel. And then Jesus gives a sermon on a, a seashore there, and there's a lot of people around. And um, Peter and these other guys are there in their boats fishing. And after Jesus finishes his sermon, he tells them, hey, throw, throw your nets you know, in. And Peter says, we have been fishing all night. We're, we're, we're spent. We're tired. I haven't caught anything. Jesus convinces, well, Peter says, you know, because you say so, we'll do it. And so he throws the nets over and they get this enormous haul of fish. And it just so floors Peter that he just drops to his knees and he tells Jesus to get away. He's a sinful man. Um, so in both of those gospels, in, in John and in Luke, there's some events that happen that, that create this impetus for them to follow Jesus. Mark doesn't give us any of that. He doesn't give any reason for someone to drop their nets, to leave their only livelihood, uh, to leave their family and follow Jesus, other than Jesus said to do it. And I think Mark wants us to see that's enough. That's enough of a reason to do it. Whatever their circumstances, these men show their repentance by dropping everything and saying yes to Jesus because he called them to do that. So Mark has already shown Jesus to be Messiah, son of God and king. And he wants, I think, to underscore that Jesus's call is all that's really needed for obedience. Jesus commands just the way that God commands. And so Jesus's way of, of calling people into this kingdom life, uh, getting on board with a program, it's, it's very different than how you and I approach things sometimes. I was sharing with our church here in the courtyard earlier this morning, you know, we have sign-up sheets for people to bring snacks when, back in the day when we could meet together inside and have uh you know, sort of some fellowship time and coffee and snacks together, you know, people would sign up. And so you put up sign-up sheets, hopefully, you know, you get those things filled out and many hands make light work and people sign up, you know, to do that. And it's, that's fine to do it that way. In this, the way Mark writes it, Jesus doesn't put up sign-up sheets uh, asking for volunteers. And he doesn't sort of post office hours about when he is going to be available to discuss Kingdom of God matters, you know, if you might find a little time in your busy schedule. Jesus stares guys down and says, you, come follow me. And so, fishing season is open. The kingdom of God is near. But also, Jesus isn't planning on fishing alone, is he? He is looking to captain a fishing crew. And so, you fishermen, come follow me. And I'll make you, what? Fishers of men or of people. And um, Jesus' fishing crew begins with people who take seriously his call to repent, to let everything go, and uh, to follow him. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this fishers of men uh, phrase that, that Jesus uses. And to simply see that as sort of this, this play on words is to kind of shortchange what might actually be going on here. Uh, it is a little bit of play on words, but I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, God is sometimes described as someone who uses a net, as someone who fishes. Um, and in the times that he is characterized um, as a fisherman, um, those passages have a pretty ominous tone to them, and they stress the idea of judgment. So let me give you a few um, God as fisherman passages. And the first one is from the, the prophet Ezekiel, and it's in chapter 12. If you got an Old Testament, that's where you're going to find it. Uh, Ezekiel is one of the, the major prophets. He's got a pretty, pretty big book there. Um, in chapter 12 and verse 12, we read this. The prince among them 
will put his things on his shoulder at dusk and leave. And a hole will be dug in the wall for him to get through. And he will cover his face so that he can't see the land. And this is God talking. He says, I will spread my net for him and he will be caught in my snare. And I'll bring him to Babylonia, the land of the Chaldeans, but he will not see it. And there he will die. And so these are words about God using his net and words about judgment. Again, in Ezekiel 32, starting in verse 2. Son of man, take up a lament concerning Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You're like a lion among the nations. You are like a monster in the seas, thrashing about in your streams, churning up the water with your feet, and muddying up the streams. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. With a great throng of people, I will what? Cast my net over you. And they will haul you up in my net. I will throw you out on the land and hurl you up onto the open field. And I will let all the birds of the sky settle on you and all the animals of the wild gorge themselves on you. I will spread your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your remains. Again, words about God using his net and words about judgment. And then one more in the prophet Amos in chapter four, in the first two verses there, he says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. He's talking to some people here, um, specific people. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy uh, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. And so this time God is employing fish hooks instead of a net. And again, though, it's about judgment. What is important for us to remember is this, you know, when, when fish are caught, life for the fish pretty much can't go on like it did before. And so the role of a fisher of men is the task of gathering people because of the imminent judgment of God. And this kind of fishing is now necessary precisely because Jesus has come. Now for these first, you know, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, these first disciples, their immediate function, their, their response to this um, of being called um, and called to become fishers of men is to go with Jesus and experience him, learn from him, be taught, um, learn about Jesus's desires for them and for, for the world. Their ultimate function is going to be to tell people the good news of what God has done through Jesus. And that good news demands a response. Why? Because judgment is looming for everybody. There are lots of, of books and blogs and websites and literature that um, is out there that talks about, you know, if you want people to, to be uncomfortable at church and you want guests to not come back, um, talk about judgment. Well, um, and, and some, for some of them, it's in a way to say, you know, uh, av avoid talking about that too much. Uh, it's kind of a turnoff. Um, and I know people who um, don't relish the idea of, of talking about that. Um, but fishing is about gathering because judgment is coming. Uh, if I have an illness and uh, the doctor knows that uh, I only have a year to live, but he doesn't want me to feel bad, um, and so he doesn't tell me that I have a year, you know, uh, I feel cheated that the truth was withheld from me. That's not all we talk about, but that is certainly such an important thing for us to talk about uh, as God's people, as people who are fishers of men. Um, 
Jesus has all kinds of good advice, life advice for us. And good advice has its place. We need to talk about good advice. But people can get some good advice and never really come to terms with letting go of everything and making Jesus the Lord of their life. Um, and they've got some good advice about how to have a better marriage. And they can still be lost. People can... Um, Learn to be a better parent through some advice from the Bible. And that is good. That's a good thing. But they, too, cannot come to terms with judgment, with their own um, mortality uh, and God's judgment and wind up being lost. You and I, uh, as believers, as people who have bought in to Jesus and saying, with all of our failures, still saying, yes, we want to follow you. We have much bigger fish to fry um, than giving good advice. It's not to give bad advice. We still give good advice. But man, much more deeply, we are involved in the good news business. That God's kingdom is near and it is amazing. God has, because there's judgment, God has made a way for us uh, to have hope in spite of his judgment that is coming. But you have to choose. So that's my encouragement for you. Uh, if you haven't chosen, man, I hope you will make a choice. If you have questions about that, you can contact me through our website, uh, www.walnutcreek3c.org. I would love to talk with you about um, this stuff here or anything else that might be on your mind. Uh, God bless you guys. Thank you for, for being here this morning. I'm sorry about the uh, mix-up or the, the, the failure we had with our live streaming. Um, and uh, we're going to keep working. We're doing the best we can. Uh, you guys have uh, an awesome, awesome day.